In the book of Ephesians, which was a, a, a letter written by the Apostle Paul, chapter 4 and verse 7, it says this. You don't have to turn to it. I will read it for you. It says, put to each one of us grace. And that word grace actually means God-given ability to do what you can't do in the natural. How many know that that's what grace is? God gives you the ability what you can't do in the natural. This is not a natural thing. This is a supernatural, although he uses natural people to do it. So he has given each of us grace and has been given to us as Christ appointed out and is given out. God gives you grace to do what you do. God will give you grace to do what you can't do. And God will help you in understanding your place in things of God. So the truth is this. Every one of you here today is a minister of God if you're a believer. How many believers do I have here today? Let me see your hand. That means that you are a believer in Christ and you are a, a member of the body and you are in the ministry. He doesn't just use a, a select few. He wants to use everybody. I am known as a pastor teacher. That's one of my special giftings. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about what is known as the five-fold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And as a pastor teacher and the head of the, the church in that essence, it is not my job, nor it is the job of the apostle, the prophet, or evangelist to do the work of the ministry per se. Now, we do work, but our work is to train you, the body of Christ, so that you can do the work of God. That's the job. That's how we work together. It doesn't just get done by itself. And you might be thinking here today, how important is that? Well, how many know that there's hurting people in this world, and even in this room right now? Let me see your hands. There's hurting people all around you. God wants to use you to touch others. Without you, ministry would be empty. Without you, ministry would be purposeless. There would be no sense of it. And therefore, it's not my job, though, to do it all. I wish to God I could. And God showed me some ways of how you can do that sometime, but that's another subject. God wants you to understand in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, that he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Here's why. To prepare God's people for the work of the ministry. Again, you're in full-time ministry. Can you give yourself a hand for that? Amen. Hallelujah. You're in it. You're in it. You're a witness for Christ. I don't care at what level you are in your walk with God, chronologically or in any way spiritually, you are a minister of God. Hallelujah. And how do you discover what that is specifically is the journey that you are needing to take right now. It is a journey that is the one most wonderful of God. I've been on it since when I was 18 years old. Matter of fact, August 1st, 1974, that was what, 40 years ago, 8 o'clock, Allentown, Pennsylvania. I know the story, and you do too. Hallelujah. And I'm so glad that I've been with the Lord. What a journey that has been. And it has been. And it's so good to know the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, what you have to understand, that's a general, special, and specific call. Some of you here are sitting down and you're wondering, how do I do this? Paul said this in Romans chapter 1, I think it was, verse 1. It says that he was a servant of Jesus Christ, an apostle unto the Gentiles. He understood that there was a general, special, and specific calling. And if you're going to go on to the perfection of what God has for you, you have to go through that process. Some people don't ever get to the second or third phase of that because they never take the steps necessary. How many know that you had to take some steps to get here to church? Some of you have actually found the church today. Can you say thank God? Hallelujah. Some people are not that good. They don't even know how to get to church. Now, that might seem funny, but the only way to get to what God wants is to go for it. You have to go for it. If you really want to be successful in your walk with God, you have to go for it. You have to go from the general, and that's where you start. The general calling of God is all the things that you're supposed to do as a Christian from the Word of God. How many know that it's important for us to pray and to read the Bible and to be able to get involved in church and, and to give and to serve and to witness and, and to grow in the things of God and to get, do all the things that the Bible tells us we as Christians are supposed to do. Now I want you to know something. You have no excuse. If you're a Christian, we are to act like it, talk like it, be like it, and go for it. 
I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. Now, if you've blown it, like all of us have, and probably will from time to time, not that we want to, but we have ups and downs up, unfortunately, if you have blown it, get back up and do it again. Hallelujah. I said, get back up and do it again. Winners never quit, and quitters never win. Don't quit this thing. Keep at it. Because the only way you can become better at something is to do it. And I don't know anybody that started off perfect except Jesus. <laughs> Amen? He started off perfect, and he always will and always has been because he is God. Now, you start with the general. That's what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to minister. Say this out loud. I am a minister of God. Hallelujah. Now, the word minister is a neat, unique word in the Greek. And it means that you are to serve. You serve God. You serve people. You serve the church. You serve. And that's not easy sometimes because we want to be served. But if we serve, God wants you to know that you'll be served. You'll be blessed. But the basic understanding we must know about the call of God and the ministry of God is that you serve would to God that all of us would get that revelation. What a church this would be, and it is, and it's becoming that. If all of us would get involved in just serving without the selfishness of just ourselves. In so doing, everybody's needs would be met. Just like in Acts chapter 4 and 5, it talked about how they all came together, sold everything they had because they saw the needs of the people, and they gave and ministered to that so they can all learn if we can all just get together. Now, that might, not, that might seem like an impossible task, but you can do your part. And don't make an excuse as though you can't. So here's some of the things you need to minister to. You're supposed to minister to the Lord. When you come in, in service here today, God wants to be ministered to. He looks at you. God actually is a show me God. Show me. He doesn't believe in a word you say until you do it. I know a lot of people say a lot of things but never do it. You can't take them at their word. Actions must follow. And so you minister to the Lord. That's what that is. Minister is actually a verb. So I minister. I do something. Do, what, do something to whom? To the Lord. Acts chapter 13 verse 2, it says, They minister to the Lord with worship and prayer and fasted. Well, you're supposed to do those things then. It's very simple. It doesn't take rocket science to understand that you worship, you pray, and you abstain from food or drink for a time because you do it out of a love for God. You minister unto the Lord. And by ministering to the Lord, you do the stuff that the Lord wants you to do because he takes pleasure when you give of yourself to him. Are you all here today? Now, I remember the first time I encountered worship. My goodness, I didn't know anything about church. I was in a good Catholic church at the time when I went to a church like this, and I saw people actually participating in worship. It kind of scared me at first because I never saw it before. The most worship I ever saw was at a football game. No offense, that's, kinda, that's worship. That is. They're cheering, they're rooting, they're, they're lifting up their team, and they're shouting, they're screaming. They were going for it. How many know what I'm talking about? Isn't it amazing? It's, it's good there, but it's crazy here. <laughs> Something's wrong. And I'm not putting down sports. I'm just saying that is worship. And that's the way we need to act in, a, in an exuberant way towards the things of God. How many love Jesus with all their heart? Come on now. How many love Jesus with all your heart? If you were at a football game, what would you do? <laughs> you're supposed to minister to your family. You know, I am an example of Jesus Christ in my family. Uh, my lovely two older girls, one of them, I think one was in a wedding yesterday, so she's not here, and, and Janice, they finally come to appreciate that their daddy's cool. <laughs> That's a neat feeling, isn't it, when they finally get it? <laughs> Because they've seen me in action over the years, and they've seen me be able to, and I'm not perfect, 
I know you are, but I'm not. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and, and ministering to my family, and let's pray, let's do God, let's go to church. Well, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting when you're the pastor of the church that you need to go to church. What excuse do you have? None. Hallelujah. You're supposed to minister, serve the world. Now, I'm not talking about be a, uh, in any way badly, doing the good, godly things as ambassadors. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 tells us we are ambassadors for Christ. We are to be examples to the world. When you go out shopping, I was at the, uh, <laughs> I was at, where was I at? Sapphire, Sapphire Car Wash. Let me know where Sapphire Car Wash is. $5 car wash, you could, it takes you through, you can use the cleaners for everything. There's this London lady, it was real interesting. You're, you're supposed to be a witness to the world. And there was an opening on the side where it was somehow it, somebody opened it up and they, you could just drive through. You're not supposed to, but this one person did. And lo and behold, she got caught. And on the front of her car, it said, prayer works. <laughs> I was talking to the guys there, and they said, man, she had that life. She was a, supposed to be a, a Christian, she said. They, that's what they said to me. We are to be examples to Jesus, of Jesus to this world. Let me just tell you something. A $5 car wash is not worth your testimony. Amen? Hallelujah. If that's the case, I'll give you $5. Don't take me up on that. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, seriously. <laughs> ministry is not about position or authority, although it does involve ministry, uh, position, and authority. Generally speaking, it's, it's serving. It's serving. It's, it's just serving. Man, it's just helping people. And when we get that in place, man, it's such a beautiful thing. And, and, and as sincere as you might be with the Lord, God wants you to know as you, he'll show you as, listen to this, as you take the steps necessary to do it. If you just sit there, nothing gets done. I mean, let I me mean, just put it simple. You have to get up and do something with your walk with God on the general, special, and specific call, and it progresses. Listen, you start off in the general things, and if God looks at you, you know, the promotion comes from the Lord. I mean, when you're at work, your boss is looking at you, your supervisors are looking at you in most cases, and they are determining whether you're a good worker, and when they see that you're a good worker over time, over time, they said, you know, Joe's pretty good. We can trust him. We can even put him in other positions, and he'll be able to do it. Well, God so does the same thing, and if you don't do the general stuff on a consistent basis because you love God, God will never show you the special. He'll never lead you into the specific. He'll, you'll stay there, and a lot of people are content with that. How many are content with just a little? How many want more of God? Let me see your hands. And it takes, it takes more than that. And the reason why you're bored with your walk is because you've made it boring. It's not boring. It's very exciting. Hallelujah. And I think it's wonderful. Hallelujah. Our goal and our objective must be to minister to people. When they come to the New Covenant, it's, 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 imagine now nobody was here. How useless it would be except for myself to learn just to do what I'm doing. And I would get it, but that's about all. But it wouldn't go very far. We have to minister to people. It's, it, it's very difficult to minister to people and find out your gift if you're actually not doing it. If you're not ministering, how can you discover it? So you have to do something to discover because it is a discovery. It is a journey. It is something that you find out. I remember when I, I, when I was called, when I first found out, man, I didn't know anything about God. I did, again, I was raised in a good, good Catholic family and I went to catechisms and stuff like that, so I knew basically certain theologies that were correct, thank God. But I didn't know much about, about the call. And all actually, well, my understanding of the call was being a priest, and I certainly didn't want to do that for myself, okay? I wanted to get married and do all the other things that that entails. Say amen. Hallelujah. 
How, you know, hallelujah. <laughs> Ministry, if you don't do it, you'll never discover it. It only operates, and it starts with the general, and it goes from there. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. It, you have to go forward. And it is people-oriented. Huh. We'll get to about the people in a minute, how important that is. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm thankful you're here today. Hallelujah. And as we begin to meet the needs of others, God will show you your ministry. You'll find out things about yourself. How many want to find out some things about yourself? Some of you might be scared to find out some things about yourself. I was. I still am. Every time my wife ta starts talking to me about my, uh, who I am, I start to get scared. I mean, seriously, because she's telling me truth. And sometimes I don't want to hear the truth. How many know what I'm talking about, guys? Amen. And so as we look at ministry, something so we should know about it. It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, do not think of yourself more highly than you should. Instead, be modest in your thinking and judge yourself according to the amount of faith that God has given to you to minister. Now, apart from the gift itself, there are three ways sometimes we operate in our walk with God. And this is something you need to understand as you learn to flow in the things of God. When you start off in ministry here at New Covenant or wherever you are in your walk with God, it'll start to reveal stuff about you of where you could do, how much you can do, what you're like, the capacity in all the areas. And I want you to so, see some things. Maybe you'll see this in your life. First of all, you'll see the capability you have to operate, which means you'll have, certain, you'll have a certain level of you'll be able to do at certain things. Some people can do more than others. Some people do good at little. And it's important to know how that is and how that works. Ministry gifts are distinguished by capacity. For example, when Moses was in the Old Testament, he knew that where some were, would able, were able to handle thousands. Some were able to handle 100. Some were able to handle 50. Some 10. Some are just one-on-one. -on -one. And there's nothing wrong with that because what you need to know is your capacity level is something you can learn. As I grow as a pastor, for example, when I get around other pastors, let me just be honest with you, that are in larger churches, have larger churches, I have to glean from them because they've been where I have not been. And they can show me things because I've not been there before. I can handle 100, 150 in attendance and stuff like that, but I don't really know what it's like personally to do 500 or 1,000. I don't know what it's like to do 5,000. I don't know, have no clue. I, I can study it. I can read about it, but there's an experiential knowledge you have to have that only comes as you do it. Now, you might be here today, and you think, well, I don't know anything about any of that. Well, you start with the one and work up from there. You start with that, and you start to work with people and start to see where you are. You'll start to see your gifting. You will be amazed what God has instilled inside of you. You'll be amazed at what you'll start to discover about yourself that, wow, I didn't know that. You know, there's a lot of things you never know until you do it. There's things that you thought you could never do until you do it. And when you discover, say, man, I didn't know that about myself. There are things yet, I'm 58 years old, that I'm discovering about myself that I didn't know I can do until I start doing it. And God has instilled inside of me things that I, I man, I just didn't know that. I have the capability. But you have to start someplace. You don't start off great, you start off small and then go into, that's why the Bible says despise not the day of small beginnings. Some of you are here today, you think you're going to go right from, I know I went to uh, some colleges and some uh, Bible colleges where the students thought they were actually going to go from, from, the, from, the, from the classroom to worldwide ministries. Actually, that's how they thought. They had this vision of grandeur, and you might have that in your life. That you're going to go from A to Z in a couple of weeks. And that's not true. That's not true. And if it is true, you're going to be the spoiledest brat you ever saw in the world. 
Uh, is anybody here listening to this? Because some of you want to do ministry and you don't even know how to do what you're doing. And it's so important to start where you are and learn and see what capacity you are at at the moment and see and judge yourself and say, this is where I need to go. This is what I need to do. I, I love this because the more you better yourself, the better it is around, the, around you as well. Now, some of you here today want to have better situations around you. And here's a secret. As you learn your capacity and you start to develop yourself spiritually, educationally, physically, in every way, things around you will begin to change. Change the inside and the outside starts to change as well. Y'all getting this? Some of you have stopped. I'm, I know I'm, I, the Lord is telling me to linger here for a while, so for this, bear with me a little bit, okay? Some of you have stopped there because your capacity level, you, and it's not easy. It's like going to the gym and starting to work out. You don't start out, I'm going to go tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. By faith, I'm going. Thank you, Lord, with my wife. <laughs> But I might not start out at a certain weight level of pressing or working out or running at a certain level. Or, you know, I'll be glad that if I can do 20 minutes on the, on the track. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? I don't think I can go an hour and a half, two hours. I don't think I can definitely bench press 400 pounds. But you start where you are and you work up. It'd be foolish for me to go out and do 400 on a bench press because I'd be sitting there and I'd be there, can you please get this thing off of me? Now let's put that spiritually. Some of you are jumping into things that you're not ready for or need help in, and that's why you're ready to get it off you. So you have to understand your capacity level. In business, in an individual, in a family. If you're not good at something, get somebody that's good at it. One of the things I've learned as a pastor is that I don't know it all. I have a wonderful board and a wonderful staff that, thank you, Jesus, am I, is it showing that bad? I have a wonderful staff, wonderful board that they are good. I got the mute, uh, uh, Mark is excellent. Christy's awesome. Joshua's totally rad, cool. <laughs> Chuck is, is wonderful most of the time. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I always pick on him. And if I stop picking on you, Chuck, that means I don't like you anymore. Hey, Amen. <laughs> you have to understand your capacity level. Then you find out the area of ministry that you're interested in. Well, how do you do that? That means you have to explore. You don't know. Now, I would advise you if it's singing that you would at least know how to sing and sing good. Say amen. Do you ever hear somebody that can't sing try to sing? That's why we have some good singers. Don't we have some good singers up here? Thank God. Hallelujah. The ministry areas are so important. God will reveal particular areas of ministry, and you'll, you'll like that. You'll have a passion for it. And I want you to, I'll explain how to do that in a minute. The areas of ministry may be particular location, a particular age, or, or, or thing, or subculture, or ethnic group background, or whatever. It'll be certain kinds of people, certain kind of things, certain kind of places. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8 says, In fact, they saw that I had been entrusted with telling the good news, Paul said, that was my gift, to people who are not circumcised, as Peter had been entrusted to tell it to those who were circumcised. The one had made Peter an apostle to the Jews and also me an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, they knew this. The church, early church knew. They looked at Peter and, and Paul. They said, you know what, Peter? You're really good with the Jews, Jewish folks. You know what, Paul? I can see by what you're doing that you're really good by dealing with these Gentile people. And you know what? They went with the call. What are you going for? Here's what you need to understand. Try some areas. Get involved. 
You're not going to grow in your walk with God. You'll be amazed of what God has in store. All the stuff that you're learning is for a purpose. It's preparatory. And God wants you to know that. Then the emphasis of ministry. As you work in the ministry, you'll discover your passion. I love to teach. I love to study. I, I, can, I don't know what's wrong with me when I get like that. Because I, I can literally study all day. That's just, I just enjoy it. To you, it might not be as much, but, man, I get so crazy. I got this new software and Bible software all the other day, and it has like 100, 200 books in it and all theological books and stuff like that. And that just makes me so excited. Now, that's weird, isn't it? But that's where my passion is, is to learn and to teach and, and to grow. And, to, and some, here's how you can tell. Some are good at gathering people. I know, for example, Brian. I know he has the evangelistical gift in him. I remember times in the past where he would be on an elevator. He can go from one floor to the next and probably go on to the seventh floor to lead him to the Lord. Because he just has a gift of gathering and reaching out to people. Some people are good at gathering. They can tell people and they just have this exuberant personality that's just overflowing. And they go out and I remember when Jeff Chaffee was here alive. But that boy can just talk to anybody and God, you ever see people like that? They just have this ability to gather. Now, we should all do that, but some are extremely good at it. And then there's some people that love to nurture. They look at young Christians, and they say, boy, I can spend some time with them and train them, and I just love to spend time where they can get it. And they get a real joy in their heart. All of a sudden, a joy comes in them because they're teaching somebody to somebody. And some people are really passionate about it. Some like to teach. And they just like to go in depth. And I'm like that as well. But God will show you the emphasis of ministry. There will be a passion. Passion is not something you, you just get. It's something you already have. And you have a passion for it. Passion for teaching. A passion for reaching out. A passion for working. Sylvie loves to cook. And some ladies, they just love to cook. And I'm so glad. <laughs> How many are going to glad for the ministry of cooking? Say amen. See that? Wow, that's pretty heavy. How about for teaching? <laughs> All right, good. Your gift has one further dimension, and this is really an important one here. We're going to close in a few minutes here. Your personality. The biggest problem you'll ever have in life is not the devil. It's going to be other people. And your personality is very important. Now, how many know that I was not born in, in Gastonia, North Carolina? Can you tell? I have a southern accent now. Don't you know that? <laughs> it was very hard for me because I was raised, in an, in, and I love my family, but we were very obnoxious. I'm going to be, and I love, my, my, there's no better mom in the world than my mama. That's the truth. My sisters are awesome. But we were very blunt and, and rough-edged. We had some personality issues. Amen. We'd just tell you what we thought. We didn't even think about it. And if we hurt your feelings, we didn't even know it. How many know people like that? Okay. Then all of a sudden, God translated and transported me to Gastonia, North Carolina. <laughs> now, in Jersey, I would have been cool. In New York, it would be all right because they just give it all back and didn't even think about it. But, man, down here, you're all sweet and kind. <laughs> you are. You're very kind. You don't. You're really not as obnoxious as, as what I was raised with. And it's the truth. You talk nice. You ever go to the, I remember when we were up north and in some of the places you go shopping. How many can watch this? You go to the checkout, and there's no talking there. There's no talking. They just go through down here. Hey, how's the kids? How's mama doing? 
What about your grandma and your grandpa on your other side of the family? How they doing there, too? We want to know how they all doing. Now, I knew last week that they were doing okay, but somebody told me they weren't doing that good, so I just want to know how they're doing. And you'll stand there for 15 minutes. It's the most annoying thing to me. <laughs> it's true. I mean, because they're very friendly, and, but my personally, I'm very... I'm not trying to be funny. This is really an issue in the church. People don't leave churches. They leave people. Name me a church that you left, and I'll name you a, a people that you got upset with. Very seldom you'll, people will leave churches for doctrinal issues. Very small. So it's so important that you know your personality type. Some are very strong. Some are very shy. Some are in between. But regardless of where you are, here's what you have to understand. We are a family. Come on now. And we need to learn how to get together. And one of the most, most important things is the kingdom of God is not color. The kingdom of God is multicolored. So there's black, there's Hispanic, there's Oriental, there's Italian, there's Southern, and there's Northern. Come on. And if you have a problem with that, then you need to expand your kingdom mind. And I'm telling you right now, your personality talent, you need to learn how to get along with people. I'll tell you right now, people at work, in most cases, will treat other people more better than they do in a church. I always tell the workers, I said, act like you're at Walmarts. I don't know how Walmarts is, but it seems like it's good whenever you go there. Hallelujah. <laughs> They're very friendly. How many know the churches should be friendly, amen? They should be friendly. When you get new people to come in, walk up to them. Don't smother them, but just be kind. Be, and if, if you meet somebody that has a real domineering attitude, hallelujah, watch how you deal with them. Get to know them. Always remember, it's important to work together. And if you do have a dominating attitude or personality, at least recognize it and know how to temper it. Am I speaking to somebody here today? We've had some issues in the church with strong personalities. You can have strong personalities. Amen. And men and women are different. How many know that? Men really don't even care as much as the women do. That's the truth. I'm going to be really exposing myself right now, okay? Please watch. Women are, are more sensitive. They really are. They're real detailed people. Guys won't even notice one-tenth of the stuff. Did you notice that? No. Did you hear that? Absolutely not. Say amen. <laughs> amen. And so it's very important. You know what I do in my staff? And if you be, you be wise to do this, ask the females in the group what they think. Come on over here, too. All you guys, you sissies. <laughs> ask the ladies. I mean, they, they know better. I love... I, they, can, they can take it to the nth degree, though, in detail. <laughs> Guys are like this. Please stop. Please stop. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? Come on now. <laughs> and so you need to know that. And ladies, you need to know how far you can go with the guy. Especially in the church. And when you do it, do it with love. Because we're all family. If you're a family, listen, I got people in my family. I, I, they're my family. And I, you're my family. The family of God. Why don't we start acting like a family? There's differences. There's all kinds of issues. There's some people in the family you might like more than others, but you still get along. Hmm. 
Hallelujah. I think that's good. Who you are will come out in time. That's why it takes time to do this. You know, there's nothing better than the brother next to you or sister next to you that really loves you and say, you know, over the time. I'm so thankful for my, my board. They, they've helped me. And I brag about them a lot because they really did. Now, I'm a kind of pastor where I don't mind being speak to or corrected in a proper way. Some pastors are not like that. That's really sad when you see that. And that's not often. But I like to see correction in my life if it's true. How about you? Hallelujah. Because let me just say something. I don't know it all. I just know I'm called into the ministry of Jesus Christ, and I'm, pa- I'm John Pellinero, and I need some help too. But I'm going there, and I need some godly people around me. Now, there's a right way to do it. There's a right time to do it. and there's a right- You know, you need to earn the right to do it too. Am I talking to somebody here? And then as you learn how to flow with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, there's some issues sometimes. Did you ever get irritated in church and you wanted to call that person out that very moment? Or at work? I want you to learn something here. As you learn to flow in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit might say to you, wait, not the right time, not the right place, and it's definitely not the right attitude that you have to express it. I've seen situations with people in church, okay, where they had issues. Well, you need to go do this. You need to do that. You need to have this, and you need to have that. I said, let's just pray. Let's wait for the right time. I'm not saying let it pass over. I think there's a right time, right place to do things. And sometimes when you're in the heat of the moment, you can destroy and become destructive instead of instructive and helpful. Instead of pulling together, you're pulling apart. I think that this is hitting home with some of you. Hallelujah. God has given you some gifts, and he expects you to get involved in that. You're not going to grow until you do. You're not meant to be a spectator. You're not meant to just sit there, although I'm thankful that you sit there. This church can't work. No church can work. No business can work. No family can work by you just sitting there. Just look at your garden for a minute. Just look at your yard. Guess what? That grass is growing right now, and it's not going to have to be cut. And you're going to have to get outside and cut the grass. You can't wish it away. Now, you can pay for somebody else to do it, but somebody's going to have to do it. And church work will not get done. Guess what? It's growing. Things are happening. People are coming. People are even going. But we need to do it in love. Hallelujah. How many want to do what God says for you to do? Now, I don't know about you here today. Come on up, gang, if you could. God wants you to work for him. He's called you to himself to reach out to this world. Seriously, guys, this is your life, okay? Not mine. I'm, I want to do what God wants. I'm here to do that. And if it's not here, please, and you feel led the Lord, to, I'm not saying that we want you to be here, but you need to find the call of God in your life because you're going to have to answer for it one day. And he's going to look at you and either say, well done, thou good and faithful, I'm going to hear those words. You've been faithful. You've been faithful. People are looking at you. Not many people last the length of time or storms that come your way. Brian, I have to prophesy over you right now. The things that have happened in the past will come into an end. The hurt that has come will only make you stronger. So be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, says the Lord. Stand up. 
do what I called you to do. Be what I want you to be. I'll bring it all together. Seek me first, and I'll pour out everything you ever wanted on your life. For I'm the Lord your God, and I have called you. Stand up, Brian. Stand up. Lift your hand towards Brian right now. The cloud of despair. We call it the liftoff. And the joy of, more, of, of gladness to come upon his life. Father, I thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Lord. That's a special thing because I know it's not me, Lord. This is you. And Lord, Father, we just encourage my brother in Christ right now as he goes forth in the things of you. Lord, let him know it's for you. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It's just for you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name. Now, if you're here today and you're really serious about going forward with God and you don't care, look at me now, right eyeball to eyeball, you don't care about what anybody else thinks. Not that you're trying to.